Hello and welcome to La Rosa Reads. I'm Denise La Rosa and today I am super duper duper excited to share with you my nonfiction November TBR. Let's talk books. Yay! The time has come to yet again indulge into some nonfiction for Nonfiction November. Nonfiction November is a reading initiative launched, started, created by the one, the only, Olive over at A Book Olive. And she has four words that can spark some creative ideas as to what you want to add to your TBR. What I love about Nonfiction November and the way that Olive has it set up is you may use those keywords. You may choose not to. You may choose to only read one nonfiction book for the month of November. All of it's okay. It is a create your own adventure type of thing, which I love those kinds of experiences. So for my own adventure, I decided to explore some reads according to the keywords that Olive has set for this year's nonfiction November. So the keywords are the following. Fraud, web, capital, and display. Now, when my girl Olive first listed these words, I was like, what the what? Like, how in the world am I going to find books to match these keywords? But lo and behold, on my shelves, were the keys to this mystery. For the word fraud, I decided to toy around with a book that may or may not count as a nonfiction read. It's um, historical fiction, but it is a little bit of a fraud because it's researched reality paired with some fiction vibes, and it is The First Ladies by Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. I love, love, love this dynamic duo. I am so excited to read this book by them, which is their second joint venture. The first one being The Personal Librarian, which was a huge success for my reading experience. And I have a feeling this exploration of the friendship between Eleanor Roosevelt and Mary McLeod Bethune will just be even more divine. This is an unlikely yet powerful friendship that evolved and really flourished during a time when both women were really forbidden to interact with each other based upon race relations in America. Eleanor Roosevelt is a beloved first lady and also knowing Mary McLeod Bethune being one of those lesser celebrated but also important figures in our American history towards civil rights is just it just makes me so excited to see what these two fantastic authors have done. One author, Marie Benedict, identifying as white. The other author, Victoria Christopher Murray, identifying as black, really do this amazing job of embodying their friendship, their collaborative efforts, embody what it means when we come together across our differences, what wonderful things can come from that. I have a feeling this book will do just that and will also help me learn more about these two important women in American history. So it's fiction, but there's some reality in there. So we'll see if it counts. For Webb, I have decided to read An Unspeakable Hope by Leon Ford. The subtitle of this book is the following. Brutality, Forgiveness, and building a better future for my son. Leon Ford is a man who is from Pittsburgh or lives in the Pittsburgh area. And I have had the pleasure, the honor of meeting this incredible human being at the Greater Pittsburgh Festival of Books. And I was so just swept away by his story and just his goodness that I am thrilled that he will be a guest speaker at the school where I work. And I really am looking forward to using Nonfiction November as the opportunity to read about his life, about his story, to see the man behind the story. I actually remember when this happened. In 2012, 19-year-old Leon Ford was shot five times by a Pittsburgh police officer during a racially charged traffic stop stemming from a case of mistaken identity. When he woke up in the hospital, he was faced with two life-changing realities. He was a new father and 
He was paralyzed from the waist down. Leon found the only way to move forward was to let go of his hatred and bitterness and learn to practice forgiveness. Leon's harrowing experience spurred a deep reckoning with his community's relationship with the police and a lifelong commitment to social activism. In the wake of countless similar shootings across the country, Leon has dedicated himself to bridging the gap between the police and the communities they are supposed to serve. I am having a difficult time getting through the rest of this synopsis, but I figure that it's best to just stop now because I do feel like you get a good sense of the man, Leon Ford, and the wonderful work he's doing to unite these communities with police officers. I am so humbled and honored to have met him and even more humbled and honored to have a chance to learn more about his story. This next book has been collecting dust on my shelves and unexpectedly so. I thought this book would be one that I would read as soon as I brought it home from the bookstore. And our nonfiction November creator, Olive, is the one who recommended it to me and was with me when I purchased it. The book is There She Was, Miss America. Yay, I am so excited to be finally getting to There She Was, The Secret History of Miss America by Amy Argestinger. As a former contestant in the Miss America system, I know some of the behind the scenes things, some of the stories, you know, back stories that maybe the general public was not as aware of, but there's also a lot there that I'm sure I have no clue about. Perhaps the most exciting thing about this nonfiction piece for me is that the author travels and does her research through the Virginia, Miss Virginia pageant system. I started off in the Miss West Virginia pageant system, but I did dabble into the Miss Virginia pageant system for a little while as well because I was a student at a university in the state of Virginia. So I can only imagine... <laughs> I can only imagine what we're going to learn and discover here. I am so excited to read There She Was, which represents capital because, you know, we have capitals in the states, in the United States of America. Maybe a stretch, but I'm going to give it a go. And finally, for display, I am choosing to read this memoir that I've been itching to read since I purchased it in April. It fits the display keyword for two reasons. Number one being that it was literally on the display, it was on display at Uncle Bobby's, the bookstore in Philly where I purchased the book. And second, because when I think of display, I also think about the entertainment industry and putting um, a show on display, being a public figure, your life is on display. Officer Clemens is a book that I feel like is the perfect match to the keyword display. I feel like this is my new wedding party book, my new passing book of La Rosa Reads. If you've been around, you'll know the connection between these three is that they keep showing up. And I keep say, saying, I'm going to read it. Can't wait to read it. I'll be reading it soon. Are you interested in me reading it? Have you read it? And then it keeps showing up again and again and again and again. However, I am committed to reading about Officer Clemens' life and his work with Mr. Rogers in the month of November. Wish me luck. Now, your girl started off her reading journey reading a ton of nonfiction books, specifically memoirs, autobiographies, biographies, and needless to say, for the past three to four years, especially around the pandemic, I really stopped reading a lot of nonfiction because quite frankly, <laughs> starting in 2020, I was trying to escape reality. So I am really stretching myself to read so much nonfiction this month that I couldn't resist. I had to add a couple of fiction pieces just to balance things out to also encourage me to keep going with nonfiction because if I make my TBR too different, too drastically different than it normally is, I feel like that will just not motivate me to get her done. I just know how I operate. So I have two fiction books that I hope to read this month. The Traveling Cat Chronicles was a book that I read, I believe this time last year, I believe it was in November or October. All I know is 
It's one of my all time favorite books. I cried, I wept, I smiled. I just had all the feels and now we have our author with the goodbye cat. Hiro Arikawa, wow, I am just smitten with this author. This work is translated by Philip Gabriel and the cover, come on you guys, look at this cover. I mean, it's just giving me all the feels already. So in the Traveling Cat Chronicles, we were following a pet owner, a cat owner, and his little love bug cat. Now we have seven cats this time around, and they're weaving their way through their owner's lives, climbing, comforting, nestling, and sometimes just tripping everyone up in this heart-tugging and inspiring collection of tales. And I really like this. Our Traveling Cat Chronicles book was like a sweeping novel, right? Here it sounds like we've got some short stories. The vibes of the Traveling Cat Chronicles, the Goodbye Cat, give me the sense that I'm kind of revisiting the nostalgia, the vibes of Before the Coffee Gets Cold and Tells from the Cafe. It's so cozy. I cannot wait. It's bursting with love and warmth. The Goodbye Cat exquisitely explores the cycle of life from birth to death as each of the seven stories explores how, in different ways, the steadiness and devotion of a well-loved cat never let us down. It's already a huge bestseller in Japan, and I know it's going to just melt hearts in America. <sighs> Ashley Winstead, I love you, boo. Ashley Winstead is one of my go-to authors now. Like, if Ashley Winstead has done it, it's an auto buy for your girl. Now, I happen to get an arc of her latest book. I'm so excited because... Midnight is the Darkest Hour is a book I have been greatly anticipating and plan to read in the month of November. So I've only read her rom-coms, uh, Fool Me Once and The Boyfriend Candidate. Had a moment there. I currently have in my house <laughs> a library book titled In My Dreams to Hold a Knife by Ashley Winstead. I haven't cracked it open yet, but I hope to do so super soon. Okay, what's going on? A killer haunts a small southern Louisiana town and two outcasts, the preacher's daughter and the boy from the wrong side of the tracks hold the key to uncovering the truth. <gasps> We've got small town southern drama. We got outcasts. We got a preacher's daughter. Okay, I'm smitten already. For fans of Verity and A Flicker in the Dark, Midnight is the Darkest Hour is a twisted tale of murder, obsessive love, and the beastly urges that lie dormant within us all, even the God-fearing folk of Bottom Springs, Louisiana. Mm. In her small hometown, librarian Ruth Cornier has always felt like an outsider, even as her beloved father rains fire and brimstone warnings from the pulpit, pulpit, from the pulpits at Holy Fire Baptist Church. <laughs> All right, so I'm not, I wasn't a fan of Verity, but like the vibes, like if Ashley Winstead does a, like some work on Colleen Hoover's book, I'm here for it. All right, I gotta keep going with this. I'm all over the place, but we shall persevere. Unfortunately for Ruth, the only things the townspeople fear more than God and the devil and apparently her preacher dad are the myths that haunt the area, like the story of the low man, a vampire figure said to steal into dinner, sinners' bedrooms and kill them on moonless nights. Okay, so we went from fire and brimstone to vampire sucking blood. Okay, when a skull is found deep in the swamp next to a mysterious carved symbol. Bottom Springs is thrown into an uproar, baby, and Ruth realizes only she and Everett, an old friend with a dark past, have the power to comb the town's secret underbelly in search of the true evil. Oh my gosh. <laughs> there is nothing funny about this book. I'm only laughing because for some reason I'm getting tongue-tied like, crazy tonight well i just told you i'm filming at night instead of during the day that's probably one of the reasons why 
that's not the norm for me. But in all seriousness, Midnight in the Darkest Hour, or no, Midnight is the Darkest Hour. I'm excited for it. I'm a little nervous about it because I don't usually read stuff about vampires and skulls and stuff. Um, but fire, what is this fire, Holy Fire Baptist Church? There's enough there that I could get with. So whew, hopefully the experience will be smoother than me reading the synopsis. Whew, Lord, y'all, I don't know. Can I do it? We shall see. These are my TBR plans for November. What are your November reading plans? Are you participating in nonfiction November? Let your girl know by hopping over into those comments so we can chat it up. And until next time, happy reading. Bye.